All right. Hello, guys. Thank you for joining our webinar. On our webinar today, we'll give an overview of Penguin's cloud-based computing given by our Chief Strategy Officer, Matt Jacobs. We will wait until the end of the webinar to answer any questions you have for us. With that, Matt, we'll talk to you about the evolution of cloud-based technical computing. Wonderful. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Ken, thank you for the introduction. Um, let's see. So Matt Jacobs, uh, Chief Strategy Officer at Penguin Computing. I've been at Penguin a very long time. Uh, for those of you who know me, um, I've been uh, an integral part of formulating our HPC strategy, uh, later our cloud strategy, and uh, more recently our integrated solution strategy. Um, today, uh, we'll have the first of a three-part series on modern cloud use for technical computing, uh, which largely involves HPC and AI and machine learning. So briefly, uh, I think uh, cloud has touched nearly every aspect of our lives, uh, whether we like it or not, from Siri to Facebook, uh, more importantly these days, probably Netflix, Instacart, and Amazon. <laughs> but um, nonetheless, here we are. It seems like cloud is sort of inescapable. And uh, while it's made uh, certainly an indelible mark on each of us personally, um, thinking about uh, how we leverage it properly in our business, especially around uh, technical computing. Um, I think, you know, we've, we've made a lot of advances there, but I think we're, we're sort of on the front end of that journey um, as, as we grow. Um, if you look at it, you know, AWS was founded in 2006, um, Azure in 2008, um, Google Cloud Platform in 2011. Um, so this is all a fairly recent phenomenon, right? We're talking about a 15-year journey here. Um, but if, if you look at these providers, um, you know, I, th I think these have been successful approaches for general enterprise technologies um, and workloads, and a little bit harder, I think, for the world that we live in around HPC uh, and AI. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit more um, about that. And as a result of that, um, Penguin Computing also founded its cloud uh, platform in 2009, uh, Penguin Computing On Demand. So um, by way of introduction, let's keep going. I just want to make sure everyone boarded the right flight today. So, so I'll share with you our itinerary. Um, we're going to talk about some industry trends that we think are shaping um, IT today. Uh, we're going to talk about the impact uh, that some of those had on Cloud 1.0 and some of the um, impacts that Cloud 1.0 had on industry trends. Uh, and then we'll talk about Cloud 2.0 and where that's taking us. And then ultimately, we'll talk about uh, the inevitable integration of these technologies. So industry trends. Um, there are a handful here that we're tracking very closely and really trying to align ourselves to as an organization. I think. Um, they're broadly applicable, and I think anyone that's trying to provide these resources to a set of technical competing users um, should be aware of them and thinking about them. Um, some of these are going to be obvious, I think, to a lot of you, and some of them, you know, maybe will help you think about these in a different light. Um, hardware abstraction uh, certainly has been um, on the move for quite some time. Um, I think here, you know, initially we saw uh, VMware put us on this path. Um, and then more recently, I think over the years, we've seen uh, centralization in the HPC and AI space. And so what we've done here is we've taken a class of users who are a little bit closer to the hardware, I think a little bit more aware of what was happening at the hardware level. Um, and we have successfully converted them more into users, especially in the technical computing space. You know, I think we have a lot of users who were almost dual homed, right? Domain experts and then de facto computer scientists in order to get their work done. Um, nonetheless, we've seen this user retreat to the application space, you know, might be the best way to describe it. Um, and it's had a significant impact on uh, how IT um, is provided to these users. Secondarily, uh, we've seen platform complexity. Um, this has been driven by two major factors. One that's a little bit closer to the hardware. Um, you know, if we call it the the death of Moore's law, but certainly the waning of it, um, you know, and, and the industry answer to that has been specialization, right? And so specialization, uh, I think is here to stay. Um, it certainly impacted us um, at the storage level uh, with uh, underlying platforms and just architectures. Um, and it's certainly making itself uh, very well felt in the compute sector 
you know, we saw uh, the first example of this, you know, with NVIDIA uh, providing a co-processing technology that was um, slightly different, you know, from what we were used to on x86 platforms. Uh, but what we're seeing now uh, with the growth of um, ARM, uh, with the growth of uh, platform-specific, uh, you know, hardware, um, in the AI and machine learning space, I think we're going to see diversity will be here to stay for quite some time. And so it's created an interesting set of, of challenges, right? Um, I think on the supply chain, it's difficult. I think it, it means that on the IT side, we have to understand a lot more about these underlying platforms um, in order to target them to the proper workloads. Um, so there's a lot there. The other aspect of platform complexity has been induced by um, the software-defined phenomena. Um, another one, you know, that's here to stay for the foreseeable future. Um, it's pervasive, you know, certainly in the server space for quite some time, uh, but more importantly in the networking and storage spaces. Um, and this just really sort of breaks traditional supply chains, right? It's it's hard on procurement. I think it's hard on IT teams. Um, you know, it it removes, or I guess I guess it forces us on the IT side of the house to to have the knowledge of what software platforms are best for the workloads at hand, how to mate those properly to hardware platforms, um, how to tune them for effective use, and then later on even support them. Um, so there's a lot going on there, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the coming slides. Cloud 2.0 absolutely um, is, is coming around the corner. Um, I think a lot of you are already seeing this in some of your own environments, um, but at a high level, you know, we have an educated consumer now. Um, cloud 1.0, which we'll contrast here momentarily, um, you know, was a little more straightforward and characterized a little differently. But here, I think we understand cost structures, who's doing what well and poorly, um, and how to, you know, fashion contracts that are good for us on the IT side. Um, I think hybrid and multi-cloud um, are going to be inevitable plays in the future here, and we're going to have to learn uh, you know, new technologies and strategies to use those effectively and provide them to our user bases effectively. And then lastly is the usage model. Um, this is a relatively newer phenomenon, um, although uh, off and on for years, we've had different alternatives as we just stated in the cloud space. Um, but in general, we're starting to see three prevalent options. Um, On-premises obviously is what we've all been doing um, as an industry for years. Um, cloud, um, as we just stated, has been the other option. Uh, and the third option we're seeing is as a service, um, which is a very interesting combination of the two of those, uh, where it converts on-premises ownership to an operational expense model, um, augments existing resources, um, and provides sort of a bridge between the two of those. And so I think we'll see that as a service model also increase in popularity as hybrid increases in popularity. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So Cloud 1.0, um, what were the drivers? What did, what did we take from it? Um, so we talked a little bit about this just momentarily. Um, the evolution of virtualization was certainly a big driver for cloud. Um, as we brought in a, um, I think a cloud native set of decision makers into the IT space, um, this uh, was a natural extension of virtualization. If we're abstracted off the hardware already for certain workloads, um, why should we care where it runs, right? Um, we talked about the platform complexity, also a big driver here, right? Um, a lot of these uh, software-defined architectures and emerging architectures, frankly, um, have been driven by some of the larger CSPs. Um, so it's only natural to, to take advantage of their um, mastery of uh, those uh, platforms and techniques and, uh, and push some of those workloads out to cloud. I think initially there was an illusion of cost savings. Uh, I don't think there are very many companies that have been able to say, I saved a lot of money by going to cloud. No doubt they're out there, uh, but the reality is if it's a properly utilized environment, it's pretty hard to say, you know, it's going to be cheaper than doing it at home. Um, but doesn't mean there aren't significant benefits to be obtained by cloud partnerships. Scalability certainly um, is a big win, right? Um, for small companies and large companies alike, uh, that's a promise delivered, absolutely. Um, a shift to an operational expense model has also been a big driver. And uh, I think uh, color of money discussion um, always you know, forces a look at uh, cloud as an option on a continuum. Um, improved time to market. 
Uh, I think for smaller companies, it's been true just to get up and running for developmental and later for production resources. And for larger companies, it gives them uh, access to technologies maybe they otherwise wouldn't have access to. And so it could improve time to market in that fashion. So what are the results? I mean, we're, as we stated before, we're 14, 15 years into this journey. What have we learned in cloud 1.0? Well, I think initially uh, we saw a modest uptake uh, followed by dramatic uptake and near euphoria, um, which, which then uh, induced a cloud first phenomenon. Um, and I think that has been a prevalent win for quite some time. Um, I think we're seeing an adjustment to that. Um, certainly we saw a lot of organizations and especially in our realm in technical computing were sort of forced to adapt their workloads to a given idiosyncrasies, let's say, of a cloud service provider's environment. Um, I say, I think that's still uh, in large part the case for specialized compute requirements and a challenge uh, for those of us who, who had those needs. Um, certainly rapid uh, sort of low investment growth for startups, as we discussed, was a, was a big win, I think, out of, out of Cloud 1.0. Um, yet the true cost of a cloud-first strategy, I think, became clear. Um, and, and really this only more recently so. Um, I think we learned that um, in the HPC, HPC space when your data set grows 10x when you put it up on a resource and you wanna bring that back, I think everyone here on this call has probably been burned uh, by some of the challenges that that can induce. Um, so, so we're smarter. Um, you know, there's been in some cases where a cloud first mentality has been prevalent in an enterprise we've certainly seen um, some uh, degradation or complete loss of skill sets in areas uh, where the technologies um, have been moved to the cloud or those workloads have been moved to the cloud. And then lastly, I think more recently, as we've all operated in the cloud more, um, I think one of the challenges we've witnessed is this sort of um, rapid growth of data sets in certain areas of the cloud um, that can sometimes get stranded um, and data gravity is real. I think we're all sort of learning the best way to cope with that. So in general, and I know I'm being, you know, I'm painting this with broad brush strokes, but this is what we really saw in cloud 1.0, especially as it relates to technical computing and HPC. So with cloud 2.0, um, what does it bring us? Uh, what should we, what should we see here? And there are a handful of themes um, that really come to mind here. Um, we're starting to see out in the field more discussion of repatriation, largely due to cost, um, sometimes due to the data gravity challenges we mentioned. Um, but in general, how would we bring some of this back on premises if we wanted to? Um, so that, that's a discussion we're having more often. Um, educated consumers want choices. So those who realize that cloud is a healthy part of their strategy um, they're going to want choices. Um, there's going to be a tighter scoping of resource to workload and how, how do they best take advantage of those environments. Um, we're certainly shifting from cloud first to cloud appropriate. I, I, I know that a lot of you on the call here today are seeing that within your own organizations. Uh, rest assured that's true really across the entire market. Um, so, so what should we be running at home? What should be running in the cloud? Um, I think we all sort of understand utilization factors um, and uh, how we best use environments on premises, you know, uh, security based, uh, is it core technology, is it core competency, um, and what should we put in the cloud, right? Is there a core technology that uh, we don't have that we need to grow? Um, is there a scalability concern? Things that we discussed in earlier slides. So those decisions are happening, those discussions are taking place. Uh, workload portability is an absolute requirement for modern architectures, um, specifically as it relates to Cloud 2.0, but in general, just supplying IT to users today uh, is going to require this. So uh, creative use of um, container technologies to help us with that is going to be a part of our diet going forward. Additionally, strategies and tools to mitigate the challenges around data gravity will be also critical. Um, and here when we say data gravity, um, what we mean is that uh, the time to insight from a given set of data is shorter than the time that it would take to move that data to a compute source to get that insight. So in other words, um, if it's gonna take me a week to move a set of data and I need answers from that data in three days, I have a data gravity problem. And so, so how do we work with that, right? Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. 
And then lastly, hybrid and multi-cloud uh, is absolutely the new paradigm. Uh, we will see uh, this become the norm going forward. And in doing so, you know, what are the right strategies and technologies to help us uh, deliver that technology in this, these architectures in the right way for our user base? So Cloud 2.0, um, it's uh, about integration, really. Um, if we look at, um, if we look at the, I think the standard approach, the historic 10 to 15 year approach, there's been this near dichotomy of on-premises and cloud, right? Um, it seems like it's an either or decision. And what we're seeing going forward is it's an integrated uh, continuum of resource for our, our, our users. Um, if you look at the block diagram here in the right side of this uh, slide, you'll see in the upper left-hand corner, um, a customer owned, customer located environment would be traditional on premises, right? And uh, if you come down uh, one to the lower left hand corner, you can see that a customer owned resource um, at, a, uh, at, a, at a, forgive me, a customer owned resource at a, at a provider location uh, would be more like a hosted environment. We're seeing more hosted um, requirements come up as enterprises adopt. Uh, denser technologies for HPC and AI um, and are looking for data centers to put them. Uh, if you come around the corner here um, to the bottom right hand corner, a supplier owned, uh, supplier located resource. Here we're just talking about cloud really. Now that can appear as public cloud, that can appear as dedicated cloud, but it's a cloud. And then if you come up to the upper right hand corner, you see a supplier owned um, customer located platform which is the as a service model that I spoke to earlier. Um, connecting all those uh, is a set of services and software um, and strategies in the middle that we'll talk about further uh, that allow for the combination of these types of engagements um, for most effect, be it for business financial purposes, be it for target workflows, be it for geographical dispersion of user base, um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. So what are the components here? We're talking about a unified compute strategy with on-premises, hybrid, and multi-cloud. Uh, we're talking about workload-defined platforms, right? So if it's an on-premises platform, is it tuned to the workload at hand? Um, and that workload will then, of course, come to play in the selection of cloud service providers. Workload-driven architectures. Now we're talking about, OK, we have the physical components, um, be they cloud or assets. How do we connect them the right way? And how do we drive toward workflows that will give us greater efficiencies as a company? Software to unify these resources will be absolutely critical. Um, the concept of having a digital lobby uh, that your users will walk into and see the full spectrum of compute resource available to them, be it storage, be it compute, be it in your on-premises or owned constellation of resources across the globe, uh, or be it uh, cloud service providers. Getting all that into one area is going to be absolutely critical. Um, strategies to meet corporate financial priorities, you know, which of these is right? Um, is the CapEx model right? Uh, is your corporate wind blowing in other ways? An operational expense right? Um, do we need to augment pieces of this uh, with certain strategies and other pieces with others? And then lastly and importantly, I think um, it's hard to find all this in one place. Uh, partnerships are going to be critical going forward. If you can find a partner that can supply all of this to you um, under one roof, uh, it certainly eases um, uh, the complexity involved with architecting, uh, sourcing, supporting um, an environment like the one I'm describing. So what's next? Um, I think the task at hand is to provide a seamless access and workflow concept uh, for our users with these modern tools and creative strategies. Uh, the view is compute as a continuum, really. Um, users shouldn't have to care so much. The dichotomy of on-premises versus cloud should be um, less abrupt. Um, the closer we can bring those together, um, I think the better off we'll be. And the focus on empowerment. How do we further our IT goals? How do we further our business objectives? And focus on delivering uh, capabilities, both technical and business capabilities, rather than physical assets. And these new technologies that we need to adopt to do this um, will enable 
this application focused user base. Um, this is the trend. So how do we supply that correctly? How do we empower that group? Uh, hybrid multi-cloud integration, this unify, unification of physical and cloud assets is going to be critical. Data gravity mitigation uh, with these powerful new technologies in the te networking space that, that, that we can share with you um, are absolutely critical. Um, workload portability, containerization of these workloads and adopting modern software architectures uh, to help your users move freely in these environments will be important. And innovative remote access, right? Bringing the data and the compute together is one step, but especially in this environment today, bringing the user closer to its compute uh, and, and storage targets is going to be absolutely critical. And there are a host of new technologies and strategies on board to help with that. And then lastly, how do we align all this with our, with our business objectives and our, and our economic objectives as a company? Um, streamlining supply chain, we talked about single source is absolutely critical. Uh, financial flexibility, uh, the ability to choose CapEx or OpEx or a mixture of both uh, in terms of how we pay for these resources and how we view them. Uh, quick technology adoption, um, both cloud and as a service models on premises um, certainly allow for faster refresh cycles, uh, whether we take advantage of those or not, but they're there. Um, and it's going to be critical uh, as we look at uh, these newer technologies that our user base has grown accustomed to, we'll have to stay in pace with that. And overall, if we get this combination right, we should end up with a total lower cost of compute, uh, certainly than cloud, um, and in some cases, um, also certainly than just on-premises only. So um, those are the concepts. Uh, this is where we think uh, the market's headed. Um, and these are topics that we believe um, that IT professionals should be aware of as we move into the next phase of development here. So um, I'll pause. Uh, a lot of concepts in there, maybe not as much detail, but it's important to state that, you know, uh, we have a handful of these um, coming up and uh, we'll look forward to delving into more detail, but temporarily I'll open it up for questions, um, please. Let's see. I'll take the first one. Uh, if cloud two means going back to on-premises, uh, do I need an investment um, in those resources uh, or is there a better way to do that? Well, um, you know, what we stated earlier, um, you're starting to see uh, more providers of on-premises as a service um, coming to the surface. Um, I think bringing on-premises, uh, if you have the skill set, uh, there's a certain class of workload that is inevitable, inevitably going to be better served and less expensive by on-premises utilization. Um, if the skill set's there, as we've witnessed with some of our enterprise customers, uh, where maybe some of this was jettisoned to the cloud and they want to bring a little bit back. Um, an on-premises service model is good um, because not only are you uh, augmenting um, your internal capabilities with the resources, but you're also inter you're internally augmenting capabilities around architecture, deployment, support, and administration uh, with these as a service models. Um, so they can be um, a very powerful tool in this sort of repatriation concept and also a very powerful tool in this concept of a continuum of compute from on-premises to cloud. Thank you for that. Any other questions? It's always hard to do these. I can't see your faces and I can't hear you applauding, <laughs> but uh, certainly happy to take any more questions. Um, Let's see, we have one more. Um, what parts of Cloud 2.0 can Penguin provide and what would I need from other vendors? Um, well, uh, Cloud 2.0, I guess, is still in the, in the process of being defined, um, but I, I think certainly Penguin is able to provide um, traditional on-premises resources um, on the one end of the spectrum, um, certainly cloud resources uh, for technical computing at the other end of the spectrum. Um, and then the software and the services in between to provide uh, an on-premises as a service model um, and the ability to integrate all that. So we can do um, most uh, of what we discussed here uh, today. Um, we have another question. Uh, you mentioned uh, networking and would touch on that more. Um, did I miss that? 
uh, do you offer InfiniBand as well as uh, Gigabit Ethernet? Yes, so uh, we do offer, um, I talked about networking in the sense of connecting uh, data to compute. So I'll, talk, I'll answer your question first and then I'll, I'll touch on this um, concept of connecting the data to the compute. Uh, we do supply um, all uh, aspects of networking. So networking from InfiniBand uh, to On The Path uh, to traditional Gigabit Ethernet, both with partners and uh, we have our own line of Gigabit Ethernet with Arctica uh, line of switches. Um, connecting of the compute and the data resources um, is a technology uh, with which we partner. Um, the technology is effectively RDMA over WAN. It's a very powerful tool. Uh, simplistically, what we're doing here is we're getting TCP out of the way and we're allowing a direct connection uh, across a dedicated or internet link uh, that gives our users the ability to bring that compute just a little bit closer. It gives effectively the full pipe. So traditional TCP uh, would give you 40 to 60 plus percent of the uh, bandwidth that you have between two resources. This gives you the whole thing. It allows the users to operate within reasonable distances. Um, something you know under 100 plus milliseconds gives you the ability to operate on that data in CTO. So if you have a data silo somewhere, you may not be forced to bring that data to the compute. You may just be able to operate on that compute where, on that data where it resides. I hope that helps. Um, how do you define edge versus cloud 2.0? Is it the same concept? Uh, they're related, uh, certainly. Um, one of the things that we're looking at um, is the stack that we have that brings the HPC environments closer together and makes them more useful as an aggregate source of uh, set of uh, uh, processing and storage capability. How do, we, how do we bring that out to the cloud? Today, we do have um, our sister partner, um, Smart Embedded Computing, uh, produces um, edge resources um, and tools. Uh, like smart cameras, um, uh, ruggedized compute to aggregate data uh, for video surveillance, marketing, and things like that. Um, the concept here is we're leveraging some of the software stack that I just mentioned to you to bring uh, that compute back into a large, our large cloud resource for things like continuous training for AI. So we'll train the original uh, neural network, we'll deploy it for inference, and then we'll bring uh, the data from that inference back, retrain that neural network, and then redeploy that for inference. Um, there's a lot more to that uh, in that question and, and would be happy um, to have a follow-on conversation with you regarding what we're doing in that space. So related but not the same, I think, is the short answer to your question. We have one more here. Um, it seems like cloud for compute is there from a cost standpoint. Uh, the biggest challenge seems to be around data storage and data movement, uh, which is not as competitive as on-premise uh, on premises storage investment. Comments or observations? Uh, yes, I, I think is the short comment to your statement, uh, but there's more to it, right? Um, we talked a little bit about um, uh, one of the software pieces in our stack, um, this RDMA over, over WAN uh, is a very, very powerful tool. We have run, um, we have run customers in Brazil, for example, in, in an environment with very, very large data sets um, to Houston. Um, so you can probably guess that's a, sort of an oil and gas uh, application for upstream. Um, and uh, those users uh, were not able to move data out of Brazil for sovereignty concerns, um, but we were able to have uh, the team in Houston operate on that data in Brazil. Granted, right, it's not as though it were local in this case because of the distance involved, but they were able to leverage that data effectively and complete their task, and they were able to do it faster than um, moving the data around. And in this case, they were also able to do it without moving the data, which was effectively a showstopper for that particular joint venture. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's an evolving uh, challenge. There are other strategies around workflows themselves. And then of course, we also have a remote visualization platform, which would be a requirement in this stack, um, regardless of uh, who you might engage, um, which also mitigates the need to move data around if you can visualize it and operate it on it in CTO. I hope that answered your question. Okay. Um, well, I, uh, I just want to thank everyone for their time today. I hope that this was uh, somewhat insightful. It was meant to be a small digestible morsel. Um, it uh, certainly is, you know, the beginning of a, a three-stage uh, discussion that we're going to have. 
Um, I appreciate the very thoughtful questions and I will hand it uh, back over to uh, Ken to wrap us up. Thank you, Matt. Thank you for listening to our webinar today, guys. I just want to inform you guys that the webinar today was just the first series of our three webinar series on navigating the clouds. Please join our upcoming webinar on exploring multi-cloud architectures on September 17th at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time.